Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Covenant of Grace Ministries YouTube channel. I'm Pastor Steve Williams, Jr., and on behalf of this kingdom ministry, uh, we want to extend the love, the grace, and the peace of Jesus Christ to each of you. Thank you for watching today, and I hope God's word that is being brought forth today by the whole inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I hope that this word will enlighten you encourage and empower you amen okay we we've uh just completed our teaching on the holy spirit's fruit and we provided an in-depth study on all nine of the holy spirit's fruit we began with the foundational fruit love and on last week we finished uh with the closing fruit which uh which was temperance or self-control um, I mentioned this on last week, and I want to say this again to everyone. Uh, if you haven't seen um, or you missed one of the fruit of the spirit messages, please take time to go back and watch this teaching. Amen. Um, I truly believe that this teaching uh, on the Holy Spirit's fruit is a life changer um, for disciples who really have a desire um, to want to grow and mature in their walk as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. So today's teaching, uh, today's message is titled, In Peters of the Holy Spirit. In Peters of the Holy Spirit. I know some of you are already asking, Reverend, what are you talking about when you say in Peter? What is an in Peter? Okay. And in Peter is anything that will hinder, restrict, obstruct, or prevent something from manifesting. So as we speak in, refer in rever reference to in Peter's of the Holy Spirit, these in Peter's inhibit the Holy Spirit from producing his fruit in our lives, okay? So today we're going to focus on six in Peter's of the Holy Spirit and how they prevent the Holy Spirit from manifesting his fruit, as well as his impactful presence and power in our lives. Now, before we begin, we're going to read our title of scripture, and it is found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. And Jesus is speaking um, in these verses. He says, beware of the false prophets who come to you dressed as sheep, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every healthy tree bears good fruit but the unhealthy tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Amen. So many times I've read this scripture um, before I began teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I would read over this passage and say, okay, well, this passage is not for me. And then one day the Holy Spirit enlightened me and said, just because you may not be a pastor at this time doesn't mean that you're not a teacher. All disciples serve as teachers in some form or fashion, okay? We don't have to have a title of pastor or minister or Sunday school superintendent to be a teacher. Church, we teach others by our lifestyle and what we say, what we do, and how we witness to others, amen? So how do we prevent ourselves from becoming a false prophet. Now, we've seen over the past uh, several months that we've been given a plan 
through the scriptures for how to produce the Holy Spirit's fruit in our lives. Okay. Good fruit is produced in our lives when we submit to the governing authority of the Holy Spirit. And when we are being filled, we're being led and we are walking under his divine leadership. I'm going to say that again. Good fruit is produced in our lives when we submit to the governing authority of the Holy Spirit and we are being filled, we're being led and walking under his divine leadership. OK, so when we step outside of the Holy Spirit's governing authority, what happens? Bad fruit will soon follow as a result. OK, and here's where the deception comes into play. We and I'm talking about the church. We are so attractive uh, to the Holy Spirit's gifts that we value them more than the Holy Spirit's fruit. I'm going to say that again. We value the Holy Spirit's gifts more than the Holy Spirit's fruit, okay? The scripture says we will know them, we will recognize them, not by their gifts, but by their fruit. A gift of the Spirit is an ability that God places upon somebody's life, someone's life. It doesn't necessarily need to be cultivated or developed. It just comes easy to us. The only thing that needs to be cultivated is how we operate in our gift. Now, in contrast, the fruit of the spirit has to be cultivated. Gifts are given, fruit is cultivated. So when we are operating in the spirit, we produce his fruit in our lives. Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 to pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. See, church, we do the opposite. We pursue gifts and we ignore the fruit. And what happens is our gifts don't have the character to carry us, okay? Our gifts don't have the character or integrity to carry us. And what happens is our gift ends up destroying us. This is why today we are teaching on these six impeders of the Holy Spirit. Church, we don't want to embellish these impeders, but what we want to do is bring light to them so that we can guard ourselves against them. We need to see how these impeders impact us as well as others. And be sure that we are not deceived by others who walk in them, okay? Now, as our title scripture tells us, we will know them. We will recognize them by their fruit. That the word them includes us as well, amen? Don't forget about that. So let's begin by looking at our first in Peter. Our first in Peter is lying and testing the Holy Spirit, lying and testing the Holy Spirit. We have an example of this in Acts chapter five. We're going to read verses three through 11. It's a story it's about uh, a couple, Ananias, the husband and his wife, Sapphira. We're going to read this. Now, a man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds, bringing only a portion of it, and he and set it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself some of the proceeds of the land? As long as it remained unsold, did it not remain in your, your own? After it was sold, the money... Was the money not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this act of hypocrisy and deceit in your heart? You have not simply lied to people, but to God and the young men in the congregation. Oh, and when hearing these words, Ananias fell down suddenly and died. And great fear and awe gripped those who had heard of it. 
And the young men in the congregation got up and wrapped up the body and carried it out and buried it. Now, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me whether you sold your land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how could you two have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. And at once she fell down at his feet and died. And the young men came and found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear and awe gripped the whole church and all who heard about these things. Woo-wee. This church is an actual life account in the New Testament. You see, people think that God's judgment is just limited to the Old Testament, but we see it right here in the New Testament, in the events that we just read in Acts 5, in verses 3 through 11, about Ananias and Sapphira who were actual members of the first church of Jesus Christ. Now, the church at this time was functioning with what Pastor Spradley has taught about. He describes it as group economics. The church was pooling their resources together and redistributing those resources back to the membership. Now, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of their property, and Ananias was attempting, attempting to mimic one of his brothers uh, by the name of Joseph, who sold some land and gave all of the proceeds to the church. However, Ananias kept some of the proceeds from his sale, but he, but he made it seem like he gave all of it to the church, and his wife, Sapphira, was aware of what he was doing. OK, Peter, the apostle Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit to call Ananias on his deception and for lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a key point. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are all susceptible for Satan to manipulate us. We're all susceptible to allow Satan to manipulate us. What Ananias did wrong was his deception in making others believe something that was untrue. He made a commitment to give all of the proceeds to the to give all of the proceeds to the church, but he deceptively kept some of the proceeds for himself to the detriment of those that were in need. He could have been honest in the beginning if he didn't if he didn't if he needed to keep some of those proceeds, church, but he chose not to. He lied to God as he did not keep his word to provide for his brothers and sisters as he had promised. Here's the key point. A lie that damages the church of God results in greater judgment. A lie that damages the church of God results in and greater judgment. And here's part two to this story. As we talk about Sophia, Sophia condemned herself by following her husband's lead into sin and also lying to God about the selling of the land. Now, with Sophia, Peter specifically asked her this question, which in this case, in her case, gives her an opportunity to repent and to get back right with God. Now, here's the thing. Although a wife is supposed to be submissive and obedient to her husband when it, um, you know, as part of the marriage, the, the Bible teaches us about one exception when it comes to obedience. That exception for obedience is when we are asked, when our spouse asks us to do something that does not align with God and his word. When, when our spouse tells us to do something that's outside of God's word, we are not to follow our spouse into sin 
because our relationship and commitment with God, the Father, God, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is always primary to our relationship with our spouse. Here's the thing. I'm going to say it again. Our love and our commitment to our spouse should never take precedence over our love and commitment to God. Okay? Sophia's bad choice led to her physical death as well. So we must, church, we must, this story tells it all. We must have our guards up when it comes to lying and testing the Holy Spirit because it results in producing bad fruit and could lead to detrimental consequences, okay? All right, let's move on to the next in Peter. The second in Peter we're gonna talk about is resisting the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit. We're gonna stay in the book of Acts. We're gonna look at Acts chapter seven and read verses 51 through 54. Um, this particular passage is a is a Stephen, Stephen who's one of the seven who was chosen by the apostles to serve the Greek Jew widows in, in, the, in the ministry serving the, uh, the Greek Jew middle, uh, widows. He was speaking to the religious leaders as they were attacking his ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's read what, what Stephen is, is speaks. And we, we, we know from the scripture, it says Stephen was full of God's grace and he was full of knowledge of Jesus Christ. So here's what he, here's how he speaks to the, the, these religious leaders. He said, you stiff necked and stubborn people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are always actively resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did, which one of the prophets did your father not prosecute. They killed those who proclaimed beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law will as ordained and delivered to you by angels, and yet you did not obey it. Now, when they heard this accusation and understood its implications, they were cut to the heart and they began grinding their teeth in rage at him. Now, do we see in verse 51 that the Holy Spirit can be resisted by us? We can resist the Holy Spirit. Here's what happens when we resist the Holy Spirit. It means that we have received the Holy Spirit's truth, okay? But we're too stubborn. We're too stiff-necked, as Stephen said, and we choose not to appropriately respond to it, okay? We receive the truth, but we're too stubborn. We're too prideful to not respond to the truth appropriately, amen? And I respond, what I mean by responding appropriately, repenting and turning, having a change in heart and turning away from the world and, and away from, from the ways of the world and, and, and moving toward the ways of God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and his word. Amen. Our stubbornness, our pride resists the Holy Spirit's ability to work in and through us. Here's the key point. Let's not be stubborn to what God says through his word and by his spirit, because the consequences can be dangerous. Dangerous, church. Those ancestors that Stephen is referring to in Acts chapter 7, they were just as stiff-necked and stubborn as the, 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 the people the, the the Pharisees and the religious leaders that he's speaking to now, those 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 uh, ancestors that Stephen was, was talking about, when they per they persecuted prophets back in that time, who though some of those prophets were prophets who fo foretold the coming of Jesus Christ, um, and these really these religious leaders that 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 Stephen is pointing out are just like them, um. 
They're wolves in sheep's clothing, as Jesus talks about in Matthew 7. They profess to treasure God's law as law keepers, but their actions demonstrate that their hearts are full of iniquity, full of lawlessness. Their rage, their, as we see in verse 54, their rage at, at Stephen was not aimed at him, but it was actually at God because they were resisting the truth that was being spoken about them, okay? So when we resist the Holy Spirit, we are truly resisting God's truth, amen? We are resisting the truth of God. All right, let's move on to the third in Peter of the Holy Spirit, which is quenching the Holy Spirit, quenching the Holy Spirit. Quenching the Holy Spirit refers to our actions that hinder the Holy Spirit from doing what he could do through us. We're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 18 through 22. In every situation, be thankful and continually give thanks to God, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do not scorn or reject gifts of prophecy or prophecies, spoken revelations, words of instructions or exhortation or warning, but test all these things carefully so that you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Withdraw and keep away from it, okay? That word quench comes from the Greek word subanumi, which means to put out or extinguish. So if we think about synonyms for the, that Greek word subanumi, a syn syn synonym would be, uh, some synonyms would be smother, uh, suppress, douse, quell, extinguish, evaporate, or dry up. Now, when we ignore the Holy Spirit's guidance on a regular basis, it has to. This is a pattern. Eventually, we will become spiritually hardened, and we will no longer be able to hear His voice, the Holy Spirit's voice. It's almost like his voice dries up or evaporates and we no longer hear it anymore. OK, think about this. Have we ever uh, been in the presence of a campfire? Have you ever all gone out to the woods and we've seen a campfire? Now, a real campfire blazes very, very bright and it's very, very hot. If you get close to it, close enough to it, you can feel the heat. But here's the thing. What happens if someone keeps throwing water onto the coals that are burning in that campfire? Now, at first, it will only dampen the heat of the flames. But if this process of throwing water continues over time, what happens is eventually the water will quench or smother or put out the fire all together, okay? So instead of us continually shutting our ears to the Holy Spirit's voice and dousing the flames of his spirits in our hearts, we must say to the Holy Spirit, yes, Lord, I'll do what you say. Or yes, Lord, I'll go where you send me. Or yes, Lord, I'll obey what you tell me. Or yes, Lord, I'll always give thanks to you. And see, one of the ways that we can douse or quench the Holy Spirit is by complaining, church. Ooh-wee. Complaining will douse out the fire of the Holy Spirit. We, and that's why Paul says, in every situation, Give thanks. We don't give thanks for the bad situation. We give thanks that God.
God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit will get us through this bad situation. Help. Amen. He'll make, he'll allow us to manage to, to get through that bad situation. Okay. When we adopt this practice of gratitude, not it's more than just an attitude of gratitude. It's a practice of gratitude. When we adopt this practice of gratitude, we begin putting fuel back on that fire again. And we begin allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. Praise God. We're going through these in Peter's church. We're, we're, we're on the fourth in Peter now. The fourth in Peter of the Holy Spirit is grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit. This refers to our actions that hinder the Holy Spirit from doing what he could do through us. That is what grieving the Holy Spirit is all about. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Do not let unwholesome words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion, so that it, it will be a blessing to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed and marked for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice. Be kind and helpful to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Hallelujah. That word grieve comes from the Greek word lupete. Lupete, which means a deep pain or grief that can only be experienced by two people who deeply love one another. Okay. This word is usually um, used to describe a husband or wife who has discovered that his or her mate has been unfaithful to them. And as a result of their unfaithfulness, the betrayed spouse is shocked, devastated, hurt, wounded, and grieved because of the pain that, that accompanies unfaithfulness. This gives us clarity, church, that our relationship with the Holy Spirit is precious, church. It is a the most valuable relationship we have. Let, let's, let's understand this. The Holy Spirit is deeply in love with us and desires to be close to us and wants to reveal himself to us. But here's the thing. When we act like the world, when we walk like the world, when we talk like the world, when we behave like the world, when we respond the way the, the world does, we cause the spirit of God to feel that shock, to feel that hurt, to feel that grief that comes with unfaithfulness. When we deliberately do what is wrong, we drag the Holy Spirit right into the mire of our seeing with us because he lives in us and he goes wherever we go. When we deliberately enter into sin, it grieves the Holy Spirit, just as a husband or wife would feel who has just discovered that his or her spouse has committed adultery. The Holy Spirit is shocked when we dishonor his presence in our lives. How, how much do we forget? How soon do we forget that he is the one who convicted us of sin and brought us to Jesus Christ? 
his spirit indwells in us when we repent and we when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. His spirit, his presence, his intimate presence in our lives sanctifies us and empowers us. And he faith, faithfully remains alongside of us to help us out of any in every situation, church. We need to recognize how precious the Holy Spirit is in our lives and honor him by making sure we live lives of integrity by receiving his power. If our behavior is out of line, what we need to do, we need to confess to him, we need to repent, so that our fellowship with him can be restored. Amen. Praise God. Let's go on to our next in Peter. The fifth in Peter of the Holy Spirit is insulting the Holy Spirit. Insulting the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. Anyone who has ignored and set aside the law of Moses is put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much greater punishment do you think he will deserve who has rejected and trampled under the foot of the Son of God and has considered unclean and common the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and has insulted the spirit of grace who imparts the unmerited favor and blessing of God? Church, Insulting the Holy Spirit means that we willingly and persistently commit the very sin for which Christ died to set us free from. I'm going to say that again. Insulting the Holy Spirit means we are willingly and persistently committing the very sin for which Christ died to set us free from. Okay? This, the author of Hebrews says that the most severe punishment of discipline for spiritual disobedience is physical death. If you want to look that up, that's in 1 John 5 and 16. This was the case in Israel for those who completely disregarded the Mosaic law. The, 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 the punishment would be their fellow brothers would stone them. And verse 29 tells us that there will be an even worse punishment for the Christian, for the disciple of Jesus Christ who defies God. And we saw this with Ananias and Sapphira. But Paul also speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he talks about God's judgment against those who showed disobedience regarding the Lord's Supper. Um, when uh, he talks about uh, the Lord's Supper. Paul shares that some believers became sick and some even died as a result of their dishonoring the Lord's Supper, okay? When we insult the spirit of grace, we willfully rebel and treat with contempt the high sacrificial price paid by Jesus Christ to bring us to salvation. Jesus Christ went to the cross to provide to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Pastor Spradley talked about this on Thursday, but we choose not to receive this for our lives. And here's the, here's the thing that folks don't realize. As disciples, we may be delivered from the eternal consequences of sin, but we will be judged in heaven at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. You want us to read about that? Go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 where they talk about that. When Jesus returns, his judgment first begins with the church. And this is not an easy thing to hear, but I'm going to tell you something. It is the truth. Hebrews 10 and 30. The verse right after verse 29 right here says that 
vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. He, scripture also talks about right after that, it says the Lord will judge his people. And when he talks about his people, he is talking about the church. Amen. All right. I'm going to go on to the six in Peter. And this six in Peter is a doozy. By, it's by far the worst in Peter of the Holy Spirit. And that is blasphemy, the Holy Spirit. We see an illustration of this in Matthew 12, um, verses 31 and 32. And just to set this up before I read it, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the church, who, who had just witnessed Jesus healing a man who was blind as well as demon possessed. The Pharisees responded to this, this miraculous act uh, by saying that, that to Jesus that that uh that you know the, the man that drove out these demons he did it by the power of Bezabel or the devil so they basically attributed Jesus healing this man from from blindness and from demons by saying he was given this power by the devil and Jesus responds to them by saying why would Satan drive out one of his own demons out of a man and heal him and he talks about a house divided cannot stand. Evil won't throw out evil, nor will good throw out good. And Jesus know, knew when he said that, that it would hit home with the Pharisees. Then he proceeds to share with them the consequences of their statement in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. He says, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy uh, will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Okay? All right. So, so God the Father reveal the reality of who Jesus is through Jesus's mighty works and his corresponding actions. Now, if a person speaks against Jesus Christ, the scripture says they will be forgiven. Here's the caveat. It says, however, if a person who blasphemies the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus Christ. He says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. So when a person blasphemies the Holy Spirit, this is what they're doing. They're, they are rejecting the demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power and they attribute this power to the devil, okay? When a, when a person reaches a state of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, they have a conscience and a hardened resistance to the truth that leads them away from humility and repentance. And without repentance, there can be no forgiveness or, or they can, there can be no restoration of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And this applies to those who confess to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Because when a person blasphemies the Holy Spirit, they are basically rejecting their salvation. Now, we saw a little bit earlier, it's okay to test the spirit. It's okay to test the spirit, to validate that the power came from God, but he's saying, do not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Once you test, do not say when you recognize the truth, don't, don't say that that power, Holy Spirit's power is attributed to the devil. Um, and so we just have to be mindful uh, about this. Like I said, this is the worst, worst form of, of, uh, of worst in Peter of the Holy Spirit that we have. And you got to be in a bad place, um, a very bad place to get to this point. So I pray that we don't ever fall trap um, to this in Peter of blasphemy, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead. We're going to close out and we're going to 
close with a bonus in Peter. This in Peter is an in Peter of grace, uh, which the Bible describes as frustrating the grace of God. And this leads to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit supplies us grace, right? We're going to look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. It says, for I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Amen. Praise God. When we are born again, when we're born again, church, our identity in Christ is the most important thing about us. Everything else is secondary, church. When we place our church denomination, when we place our political affiliation, when we place our fraternity, sorority, or social club, or race above our identity in Christ, what we do is we forget God's amazing grace. We forget that the cross was more than just a historical event. We forget that the cross impacts every aspect of our lives. So when we become law conscious instead of grace conscious, this cancels or frustrates the power of grace to work in our lives. We, we basically become unplugged from the power source. And that power source that we're talking about is the person we know as the Holy Spirit, who is the supplier of grace. When we unplug ourselves from the Holy Spirit, we are basically saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ is irrelevant and his power is not enough. This church, this is something that we can be susceptible to because this is how the world functions. And we can bring the world's ways into the church. Amen? Here's the thing. We can do nothing of any spiritual value with our own power, our own might, or our own intellect, church. True spiritual maturity doesn't come from performing a list of rules and regulations, but it comes from an outpouring, continual flow of grace when we submit to the governing authority of the Holy Spirit. Now, so in order for us to live under grace and not frustrate grace, we must choose to die to the law. Amen. We must choose to die to that Old Testament Mosaic law. If you want to read some more about that, Paul speaks to that in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Amen. All right. We, in summary, we've covered the six in Peter's of the Holy Spirit. We talked the first talked about lying and testing the Holy Spirit, uh, resisting the Holy Spirit. We talked about quenching the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit, insulting the Holy Spirit, and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Okay. We also add the bonus in Peter, which is frustrating the grace of God. Okay. Let's guard ourselves, church. Let's guard ourselves um, from these in Peter's so that we can produce the Holy Spirit's fruit in our lives. Amen. So that we can be effective disciples for the kingdom of God. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thanks again for joining us today. I pray that the message that the Holy Spirit um, brought forth um, today has blessed our souls before we close with our, with our prayer and benediction. 
just want to share with you a few ways that you can support this kingdom ministry. Um, first thing that you can do is, is pray prayer, your prayers of encouragement. I think your prayers of encouragement um, go a long way. And I, and I think Pastor Press Sp Bradley and I both uh, agree and appreciate your prayers and support um, giving us encouragement. That's always, that always blesses us and continue, helps us to continue um, this race of, of, of learning and, and growing and helping, wanting to help and share God's word with you so that you can grow and be better uh, disciples for the kingdom. Another way that you can support this kingdom ministry, um, subscribing to our YouTube channel. Um, if you've already done that, make sure you click that notification icon so you're alerted when new messages have been po posted. Um, in addition to that, if this message has blessed you, take time to share this message with someone in your circle so that they can be blessed as well. Amen. All right. Final thing, if you want to plant a financial seed to Covenant Grace Ministries, uh, we have the information that's shown here. Um, we're so thankful um, for the many ways that you continue to support this kingdom ministry. And don't forget, we invite you to join us again Thursday as Pastor Spradley will be sharing his prophetic soundbite message. Don't miss another opportunity to get a rich dose of God's word to encourage and uplift your souls. Amen. All right. Let's close out with our prayer and benediction. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful today. Uh, we thank, we're so thankful for your word. And we are so grateful that we're, we don't have to walk in the works of the flesh. Because of your grace, we can surrender to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us. This begins by repenting of our dead works and by placing our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior in our lives. In addition, it's also by submitting to the governing authority of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that your divine nature be manifested in us so that we can produce the fruit that you produce uh, in us, Lord, the Holy Spirit's fruit in us. Allow your spirit to work mightily in and through us so that your fruit becomes an integral part of our lives. Lord, if there are areas in our lives where there are impeders of your spirit operating in us, Lord, we ask that you help us in these areas so that we can look more and more like you. And now unto him, was able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. May the love of God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we have the blessed opportunity to come together again in Christian fellowship. And all of God's people responded by saying, Amen. Love you all. God bless you. We will see you next time.